the Sustainability Management Master's program, you're answering one simple question. Do you care about your future generation? You know, if you care about your kids, their kids, their grandkids, then you care about sustainability. And a sustainability manager is someone who has the tools to make people understand how they can contribute towards developing a sustainable world. We have both part-time and full-time students. Our curriculum is 30 hours. Instead of thesis, we have a research project course and a seminar course which provides them with the kind of research background they will need to be successful in their job. At the same time, sustainability is not always everything about environment. It also relates to the business. They will take a sustainable business strategies course. They will take a project management course. Most of these courses are going to be taught by industry people, the people who are doing sustainability on a daily basis as a part of their job. Any organization that has a large number of employees and has a physical infrastructure, they will have to have a sustainability office. If you have the passion to develop and maintain a sustainable world, come to us and we will help you shape your passion into a career which will create an impact. The Stevens Institute of Technology is proud to present the Hugo New Corporation Sustainability Seminar Series. Brought to you by Brown and Codwell, Geocetic Consultants, H2M Architect and Engineers, BEM Systems, and Catalyst Group. Yeah, thanks, Dibs. It's good to be back. Um, this is my third year um, participating in the program, and I think what you've created here is really fantastic. And, um, you know, the sustainability issue is only going to get stronger and stronger uh, in the private sector, in the public sector. And this PFAS issue is, is really coming up a lot because of the broad impacts that it has on water supplies and all the media that you just mentioned. I actually read an article uh, this morning that uh, reported on detections of PFAS up high on Mount Everest. And so it's, 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 it's in a lot of places. Polar bears have been detected to have it in their blood systems. And so we'll touch on a, a lot of this, you know, the, the uh, ubiquitous nature of these compounds and why they are so uh, as we get into the presentation. So let me just roll to my title slide. Uh, as Dib said, we're going to talk about per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, I have been uh, working with these for several years now. They fall into the category of what we call emerging contaminants. Um, and the PFAS wave has certainly hit our industry and very, very broadly. So uh, I hope to impart a little bit of knowledge uh, on, on the subject. I hope to generate uh, some discussion and would be happy to take questions. Uh, Samir, if you can field questions during it, if people raise their hand, I don't know if you prefer to do it um, live or wait until the end, I'm fine. It's up to you, I... Jim, like whichever way you want it to be. Yeah, either way, if, so, if you have a hand raising thing or something where you, somebody has a question, just let me know, because I'll be focusing on the slides and may not see it, so I don't okay, want to- Okay, I'll look for the hands raised. Yeah. They will... Uh, they know how not to <laughs> raise those physically any longer, electronically, please. Okay, so let me, uh, let me get into the agenda here. We're going to learn a little bit about PFAS as a class of chemicals and talk about them and their structure and, um, you know, why they're so persistent. Uh, we're going to talk about the regulatory climate and really, you know, what is it that's driving all the attention around PFAS? Um, it's, they seemingly came out of nowhere. It's really been the last couple of years, but if you if you dig into the academic side of things, uh, they've been under study for probably the better part of the last 20 years. We're going to talk about the importance of laboratory um, considerations and how, how we're detecting these compounds in the environment. And I'll get into that a little bit in the conversation, but we're now pushing the limits of technology and the importance of accuracy is a, is a real big deal in, in our industry. Uh, obviously, looking at treatment technologies, how are we getting rid of these things? Um, you know, the preference being to destroy them, but there's a lot of technology right now, conventional technology, that really is looking to transfer it from one media to another, and that, that can present some problems. We'll talk about the uh, issue of water reuse. Um, our firm, Brown and Caldwell, and many other firms are very, very focused on uh, reusing our resources and 
So water reuse and potable reuse um, are considerations. Um, and then we'll get into some discussion. So with that, let me dive right in. We'll do a little bit of an overview. Hey, you know, I wanted to ask before I went to that first slide, if anybody knows or has heard about PFAS and knows where they might be used, why they might be appearing up high on Mount Everest, for example, anybody? Shannon has raised her hand. Uh, I We had a speaker about it last year in environmental law, and it's in a lot of like the raincoats that we use and other protective gear. And then a yeah, lot All that weatherproof gear, all those tents that they pitch up on Everest, uh, the, the weatherproof gear, it's, it's all fantastic at, at repelling water. And the reason is because of the nature of uh, the PFAS compounds that are used in it. So very good. Thanks, Shannon. I appreciate you chiming in, but uh, you're going to get a feel for it right here. It's virtually everywhere. Um, you know, we've got, let's see, can I? Yeah, okay. Um, if you look at this long list of, of um, commercial products and, and um, consumer products even, you know, stain resistant products, carpeting uh, was a big one, stain resistant clothing, uh, fast food packaging is a big one. The electronics in industry is one of the major sources. Aviation industry using what's called AFFF or aqueous film forming phones. These things are fantastic at putting out petroleum based fires, fuel based fires. Um, and so they've been very, very widely used. Uh, I could probably talk for a full hour just about that, but um, just suffice to say that they're very, very widely used and they've been around for a long time. Um, if you look at this table here, Teflon was one of the, the first compounds developed by DuPont back in the 30s and 40s. And pretty quickly from there, they evolved into developing other perfluorinated compounds. This one is perfluorooctane sulfonate, okay, PFOS as it's known, used in firefighting foams and such. PFOA is one that's very, very widely used in protective coatings and such. Both of these, 98% um, of the population has detectable levels in their blood serum. Um, PFNA is another one used in, in various products. These three in the state of New Jersey, we'll see later, are currently regulated with MCLs. And then there's a whole host of other, other compounds and um, the manufacturing methods right down here, electrochemical fluorination and fluorotelomerization are the two primary methods um, with which these compounds are developed. But it wasn't a long time ago that we weren't so concerned. Uh, this is probably a late 80s type of photo. And this is back when we thought, hey, these things are so inert and they don't react and there's no problems with them. But uh, as we're finding out, as, as the, the, uh, the body of evidence and, and scientific studies evolves, uh, we're seeing that they do have uh, the potential to impart adverse health effects. And so the, the, the theme of the presentation here is really, you know, where are PFAS uh, impacting the water cycle? Um, in our business, everything you see on this graphic is, is part of our business. Um, you know, points of human exposure are of great concern to us, air, consumer products, private and public water supplies, food and food, food uh, packaging materials, uh, all have the potential to be uh, direct exposure pathways or transport PFAS to other areas where we might be exposed to them. I mentioned airports. Manufacturing, in, in, in many cases, uses uh, PFAS compounds. They generate waste that can go to landfills. Landfills and wastewater treatment plants have historically played a very important role in our society. Biosolids sometimes get disposed of in landfills. Landfill leachate sometimes gets disposed of in, in POTWs. And now that relationship is under tremendous strain because of this PFAS movement. Um, biosolids leaving a treatment plant and being applied as fertilizer in farm fields. Now there's concern that the biosolids are transporting PFAS to the groundwater supplies. What level is safe is a, is a, is a topic of study. And Dibs, you guys may be 
looking at some things associated with um, uh, desorption of PFAS from biosolids. That's yes. very important to us. Um, the idea of incinerating biosolids is, is very important to us. We're actually very active right now with a Water Research Foundation study looking at the incineration of biosolids and multiple hearth incinerators that a number of our uh, municipal clients operate and finding out what the fate and transport of PFAS is in this process. So there's a lot of places where we're encountering PFAS and you know, they all kind of um, come back to our water supply. So um, I've been at this for probably 30 years in the environmental industry. Uh, Dibs mentioned my, my academic career at Rutgers, um, you know, here in New Jersey, what I call the, you know, the, the capital of uh, the hazardous waste site capital of, of the world. Um, and I've worked with PCBs, I've worked with dioxins, I've worked with VOCs and such. And all these chemical families have, you know, they have a, a, a fair number of compounds, but they, they pale in comparison to the number of compounds that are currently attributed to the PFAS class of chemicals. And I put this slide up here just to show the different classes. We got carboxylic acid, PFAS compounds, sulfonic acids, and, and so forth. And then here down the right side, uh, I don't know if this appears on your screen. Let me move that thing. But here we see peer reviewed articles going back about 20 years. So you see that they've been, uh, you know, the attention of academia for, for about 20 years. Um, but there's only relatively few that have been studied and the numbers drop off pretty quickly. So um, the general consensus in, in academia is that we've, we've studied them a fair bit, but not very broadly. And more information is needed before we rush to judgment on regulating the PFAS as a class of compounds, assigning a single number for a cleanup, of, for example, to one uh, class of compounds. Whoop. There we go. So um, a little bit about the structure of, of these perfluoroalkyl compounds. They generally have a tail structure and it's generally carbon-based with fluorine replacing all of the hydrogens that would, you would normally see in a compound like octane. And so the fluorine structure here, carbon fluorine bonds, and then usually at the other end, there's a head of some sort of a functional group, in this case, uh, a sulfate group, in this case, a carboxylic acid group, and those things give it uh, certain properties. Um, this Part of the molecule is generally soluble in water, while the hydrocarbon, as you would expect, is, is not soluble. So they, they tend to be surface active. They tend to be um, have surfactant-like qualities. Um, and uh, that plays a role in, in how they are used in, in various products and such. Um, and then this is just a convention on how things are named. They gen generally, if they're perfluorinated, PF, Eight carbons, for example, octane, and if it's a sulfate functional group, you get sulfonate. They are very persistent in the environment. Uh, they tend not to react. And the reason that they tend not to react is because of the carbon fluorine bond and this number right here. Generally, the strongest chemical bond in chemistry in nature is the carbon and fluorine bond. So when you get these structures, they're just very, very difficult to break down. And they tend to persist not only in the environment, but into the org in the organisms that might absorb them from, from exposure. Um, and we'll talk a little in a little while about the, the, the concentrations that we're looking to regulate these things at. And it's largely associated with their persistence. The fact that they don't break down when they're in our systems, they tend to have a very, very long half-life. And that is part of the reason that um, they're, they're being um, strictly regulated. So let's talk about the regulatory climate around PFAS and where what started this whole situation. Uh, if any of you are familiar, maybe from an environmental law class, uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act is the primary 
uh, uh, law under EPA that regulates our drinking water supply. And EPA is mandated under that uh, act to identify up to 30 unregulated contaminants every five years. And the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule uh, has um, recently completed its fourth round. Under UCMR3, which was a data collection effort back in 2013 to 2015, PFAS was added, six PFAS compounds for the first time. And they were found in public water systems serving more than 10,000 people and then 800 or so other systems serving less than 10,000 people. So a very broad and wide sampling across the US and PFAS were largely detected but in this bullet here, this is the health advisory level that EPA has set. And I'll talk about that in a few slides, but it's basically a number that they said, this is, is what we're screening health effects uh, around. And almost 1% of all uh, systems tested exceeded that health advisory level. Many more were detected, but below the health advisory level. So here's a map that was put together using a lot of that UCMR3 data. This is produced by an organization called the Environmental Working Group. They're a consumer advocacy group and they are very proactive around you know, identifying problems and, and bringing them to light and possibly sometimes blowing them out of proportion. It all, it all depends on your perspective. Um, we taught you, some of you may have heard the comments earlier um, uh, Dibs and I chatting about COVID um, and you know uh, personal illnesses that we, we all deal with relative to things like PFAS. Um, you know it sort of pales in comparison, but when you see the frequency with which PFAS appears and the potential for a large portion of the population to be exposed, uh, it gets people's attention. Jim, Alex raised his hand. Hey, Alex, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I just had a quick question sure. um, because this is probably going to come up a lot. So how just in terms of PFAS, PFAS, um, the other uh, compounds that you were uh, describing, how, how soluble are they? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, they are, they tend to be very soluble because like I said, they behave like surfactants. But if there is an interface in the system, uh, an air water interface, for example, the PFAS compounds will tend to concentrate at the interface with their insoluble or hydrocarbon tail, if you will, sticking out and their water soluble uh, head in the water phase. Um, but if there's no interface, they generally um, distribute within the water phase. Good question. So again, um, just an, a, another graphic that shows the, the progression from UCMR3 focusing on these top six compounds. Uh, these uh, two at the top here got early attention because they were most widely used in US manufacturing. Uh, PFOS was banned from U.S. manufacturing probably 15 years ago, PFO about eight to 10 years ago, I believe it is. Um, so they are no longer allowed to be in U.S. made products. Part of the problem is, is that they haven't been banned overseas and we do a lot of importing. And so they still appear in a lot of consumer products. Um, as we get into UCMR5, the sampling for which will take place in 20. 23 through 2025, some of these compounds are expected to appear in the sampling. And uh, we'll probably find that some of them are, are present. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of potential uh, to, to find these compounds. The question is, how should EPA go about regulating them? And that right there is, is a big issue at the state level. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides. So research, studies, policy I've mentioned, rulemaking, those are struggling to keep up with social, social media in many cases. Have any of y'all heard about the movie, The Devil We Know? Uh, that was a major Hollywood picture. Mark Ruffalo, Anne Hathaway, major 
uh, A-listers starred in this movie. And this is really about uh, DuPont and their uh, development of perfluorinated compounds uh, at their plant in, in West Virginia. And it talked about real human exposure at very, very high concentrations and, and some of the effects that occur there. And so it got a lot of attention. And uh, folks like the Environmental Working Group tend to highlight that, and it gets the attention of policy and rulemakers. Um, and then the states start to latch on to that. And it starts to gain momentum and social media uh, get, gets a hold of it. And then the news media get a hold of it. And it's difficult for science, which generally takes a long time to do you know, validated studies um, to keep up with what some would call uh, the hype or hysteria, some would even say, around the issue. Uh, Jim, uh, Brendan, yeah. Brendan has a question. Yeah, and guys, I'm not seeing the, the hand raising screen. I took it off because it looked like it was covering part of my slides. So I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll, I'll alert you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brendan? Yeah, hi. Um, just a quick question. You were mentioning that uh, the two compounds, PFOS and PFO, they're banned here in the state. But when we have these multinational companies that have factories overseas, are they still bound by that or they play by the local rules overseas? You know, it's a good question, and I think it varies from company to company. Um, generally speaking, in my experience, you know, I've been working for industry for 30 years, and when we go abroad, they tend to overlay their U.S. guidelines on their overseas facilities. We tend to have some of the strictest environmental rules and policies in the world, and so I think that they get away from using those and it's, it has to do with a lot of this corporate social responsibility and sustainability programs. You know, they're all producing these CSR reports and have to talk about their worldwide activities because people are investing and some people don't want to invest in companies that are not doing the, the, the so-called right thing. And so I think because they've been banned, at least those two compounds, and now we're talking two of 5,000, right? Um, you know, is that enough? Some companies are going the extra mile and starting to ban uh, or try and find substitutes for any compounds that have carbon fluorine bonds. Um, so, and it's, it's a controversial issue too, because a lot of folks um, in the devil we know, you'll, you'll, you'll see that there's some discussion about research that companies like DuPont and 3M were doing back in the 50s and 60s, and they really didn't release the information it almost gave the appearance of, we think these compounds are too valuable to society to, to deter their use. Um, and so I think that's resulted in a lot of the backlash that we're seeing, uh, including a, a very unusual uh, phenomenon in our industry, whereas somebody may have released these compounds into the environment that had no idea that they were harmful. And instead of going after those entities, um, the agencies are now going back <laughs> to the producers of the compounds. So DuPont and, and 3M and maybe select others are really on the defensive around liabilities associated with these compounds because they are very widely spread in the environment. Good question, Brendan, thank you. Stanley has a question as well. Yeah, Stanley. Uh, hello, um, so does that mean since they were banned more or less 15 years ago, has the presence in the environment uh, fallen? Yeah, so I, I mentioned their persistence and such, and they, they generally tend not to break down very readily. There, there are some compounds that you see this per and polyfluoro, okay? Per means they're re relatively, they're saturated. All the carbon hydrogen bonds have been replaced with carbon fluorine. Those are the really toughest ones to break down. Some of the polyfluoroalkyl substances are not completely saturated with fluorine. They tend to be more reactive, uh, but in some instances, uh, these and other what are called precursor compounds uh, will react and they will uh, convert to perfluorinated compounds. You know, some of these polyfluorinated that come into a sewage treatment plant, for example, under oxidizing conditions in, in like an activated sludge lagoon, they can be oxidized to some of these very, very persistent perfluorinated compounds. So that's why biosolids is a real issue because 
these compounds come into the plant, they can react a little bit, form these persistent compounds, and they tend to stick to things like biosolids. So that's a bad sign. Thank you. Yeah, like I said, the half-life of these things in, in, in humans is on the order of three to five years, PFOA and PFOS. Some of the shorter chains, like the um, uh, perfluorobutane uh, uh, sulfonate, uh, are much shorter half-lives. And so some of the compounds that are being substituted are these shorter chain compounds. The question is, are they any better? And that was, that's where some of the studies have to really catch up. Good Thank question. You. We good? Yes. All right, great. So uh, again, this is sort of really coming at it from EPA's perspective. In 2009, they published what was called a provisional health advisory level for these two compounds, again, getting the most attention. But as more and more became known about them seven years later, they developed this 70 part per trillion limit. And that is the sum of PFOA and PFOS in a drinking water sample. And so when I said earlier that 0.9% of the pop, uh, this population studied uh, of water supplies, 0.9% uh, exceeded the 70 part per trillion limit for these two. So, but new, new studies are showing that it's detectable in most people's blood, but the, the levels are decreasing. So that might address uh, the question you just asked regarding their persistence. Because we've taken them out of our supply, because they're no longer used in food packaging wrap, uh, wrapping, and you'll see in a slide or two, um, our exposure is not mostly from water supplies, it's mostly from food and food packaging. And then um, 20, oh, excuse me, 2019, EPA issued its PFAS action plan. And in there, they made their commitment to develop MCLs for PFOS and PFOA. And a lot of states felt like EPA was sort of laying an egg with that, but um, they, they're really bound by, you know, they, they would like to do more, um, but they don't have the, the scientific research for other compounds. And so they're focusing on these two. And if they move too quickly, they'll be sued by one group. And if they don't, you know, uh, move fast enough, they'll be sued by other groups. So they are literally, they are following the Safe Drinking Water Act protocol for developing MCLs, and it's a very slow process. And Jim, some states aren't happy with that, and they're taking action themselves. Jim, like uh, here in New Jersey, we have started regulating P4 and PFOS, right, at much lower levels. Like uh, Yeah, we'll touch on that in a few slides. Um, oh, okay. All right. P PFNA is the, is the third one that's been... Um, regulated here in Jersey. But let me get to this exposure slide. Uh, our chief toxicologist, Tamara Sorrell, uh, presented this information from a literature review she did. She asked the question, where is most of our exposure coming from? And she found a dozen or more studies and basically compiled these pie charts, which focus, you can see that most of the colors here are focused around diet and exposure from diet and food packaging in some respect. The diet, um, uh, component is in food products that we eat that may be in contact with food food packaging or not. It may just be from uh, crops and things of that nature that are irrigated with, with water that might contain it, or the fields are fertilized with biosolids that might contain it, and we get exposed by eating those, those foods. But you can see tap water in most instances only a couple of studies really hit on tap water as a major source of exposure. And so the question becomes, again, I'm sorry about that. Where, where do we invest our public uh, funds you know, in terms of reducing public exposure? Is it better to work on, hey, how do we get it out of our food supply? Or is it better to work on getting it out of our water supply? And it all depends on who you ask, and it all depends on how much money is available, right? So a timeline from EPA, and this sort of goes back to the UCMR3 here. I should have had the three right in here, but that's that data collected here. There's the lifetime health advisory, uh, the action plan in 2019, and it goes on and gets into you know uh, 
EPA developing what they call their risk communication toolbox. How are we assessing risk from exposure? You know, how, you know this whole one in a million exposure level uh, is something that EPA is trying to help um, the scientific community develop and understand better. So that's sort of down the road. You see UCMR5 is here, that's proposed. And we expect the final ruling on that later this year and then getting the sampling of those same water systems that were sampled under UCMR3 to be sampled in 2023 to 2025. Jim, Shannon has a question. Yes, Shannon. Sorry, for the slide right before, but when they're looking at deciding whether they wanna to try to get out of diet versus out of the water, are they taking into account other organisms that would get affected by the water and then affect us more than the diet in that sense? Yeah, so you, 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 if you go back to, and I'll show it again later, but the, the graphic where I showed the water supply, you know, wastewater treatment plants don't partition it um, perfectly. It doesn't all go into the biosolids. A lot of it goes through, uh, or some of it goes through the treatment plant untreated and into the receiving waters. And those might contain uh, uh, aquatic organisms, and those aquatic organisms might be consumed by organisms that we would consume. And so, you know, you go back to the whole, hey, don't eat too much swordfish, it's got mercury in it. You know, what kinds of uh, aquatic organisms should we be careful about eating because they have uh, uh, accumulated certain levels of PFAS in them and by consuming them, we're exposing ourselves. So I don't think there's a, 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 a large debate uh, going on right now as to where we should spend our money. This is our chief toxicologist saying, it's something we should look at and knowing that we have limited resources, you know, we have to ask ourselves a question, what's the best use of our funds to uh, reduce exposure? Alex has a question as well. Sure, thanks Alex. Yeah, no, so it makes sense to me that, you know, drinking it, um, would get into our bloodstream. Um, how exactly would inhaling dust or even food packaging, is food packaging because um, similar to plastic, it, it, it photodegrades or how exactly do those two, or, or carpet, can you explain a couple of um, the mechanisms by which it would get into our, our bloodstream aside from diet? Yeah, the, so the, the, the air component, you know, inhaling it and getting it into your lungs, and there's probably some mechanism for it to be um, absorbed into the bloodstream, depending on particle size and, uh, and, and that. Um, with regard to food packaging, I, I literally think it's a surface coating that they put on. You know, picture the pizza box, and I, you know, I'm, I'm dating myself here, but back in the 70s, we used to take a pizza box home in the car and you put it on your lap and you get home and you have these big grease stains on, on your lap. Somebody said, I don't like that. Let's coat the bottom of the pizza boxes with um, a PFAS formulation. And they did that. And now you don't get pizza boxes bleeding through onto, onto the outside anymore. And so that pizza being in contact with that material um, has the potential to okay. take on a PFAS load that you consume. All right. We, uh, we say to our people that go out in the field to sample for PFAS, and we'll talk about this a little later, but you know, if you go and get that cheeseburger from McDonald's, be really careful about touching your sample bottles after lunch because you're possibly cross-contaminating them. Right, okay. And there's been studies about this done and, and stuff, and it's, you know, use really good sampling te technique and such, and you'll avoid cross-contamination, but because these, you know, you got the rain gear out there and you're sampling out in the rain, you have the potential you know, same reason that stuff is detected up on Mount, Mount Everest, this stuff has a partitioning effect and water comes into play and it'll partition into the water to some extent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So going beyond the timeline, and this is addressing the issue of some of the states getting more aggressive. Um, you know, Michigan um, had a, or actually Minnesota is, is, is one location I don't have it on here, but they had a big case with 3M there. And 3M had a plant that was making PFAS compounds and distributed uh, generally around the, the larger uh, Minneapolis St. Paul area. And they reached an $850 million settlement there. But because EPA is, is perceived to be dragging their feet with regulations, some of these states 
um, are being more aggressive and going after other compounds. And I think these were largely driven by uh, that, that 3M case. Uh, Michigan has a lot of sites, if you go back to the map I showed earlier, a lot of sites where PFAS are detected. Uh, New Jersey, here we are, PFOA, PFOS, and PFNA are regulated. These are actually MCLs in the state of New Jersey. So these are drinking water criteria as opposed to groundwater quality standards. And there's a subtle difference between the two. Um, so you can see there are some states that are much more active. Uh, if you were to go onto Oklahoma's website and look up uh, PFAS, you'll find very little. You'll find that they're basically waiting for EPA to decide what they're going to do with PFOA and PFOS. And so there's, there's somewhat of a political game going on here in terms of how uh, states are responding. Um, and it's very interesting. A lot of activity up in the Northeast around um, states taking action um, to be more proactive. So yeah, I just mentioned this, New Jersey, California is very active. Uh, they actually got way out ahead of this in determining what they call reference levels there. And they were sub part per trillion numbers. And so now we're dealing with nanograms per liter. Back in the 80s, when I was working in a graduate laboratory, you know, it was a wonder that our instruments could measure parts per million. And then we went into the 90s and got into the parts per billion with the VOCs and, and other um, uh, compounds. Now we're dealing in the parts per trillion. And again, that's largely driven by the, uh, the half-life of these compounds and persisting in, in um, uh, living organisms. Uh, and just a, a, a look at how states like California are responding. I mentioned the aviation industry earlier. Most every airport, uh, if for no other reason other than insurance companies that are issuing policies say, you have to have this available, this firefighting foam available because it helps preserve property that we insure. And so all the airports are in the mix of uh, having uh, PFAS systems that occasionally need to be tested. They have training areas where they, they have their firefighting organizations go out onto the tarmac or somewhere where they stage a fire and they apply the foams and then they wash it down. It goes off the side of the tarmac and into surface water. And so you can see how it gets around. A lot of landfills are the targets because they are receptacles for a lot of uh, waste products that contain PFAS. And especially if they're unlined landfills, you know, they are potential sources of PFAS contamination to groundwater. So California is very aggressively looking at this issue. Laboratory considerations. I'll try to go through these relatively quickly because we're, we're running on time, but EPA has yet to approve a method for any matrix other than drinking water. And that's a very interesting result because we deal with things other than drinking water, particularly on the industrial side of our program. They've uh, last year approved method 533, which per my next slide was under development when this slide was uh, put together, but this has since been um, uh, uh, approved by EPA. And between that and 537, we can monitor a total of 29 and quantify a total of 29 PFAS compounds. And so that piece presents a problem. And because we're measuring at low levels, we have to find qualified laboratories. We also have to develop good sampling protocols and making sure that we're generating data that we can make decisions on and learn from. And so making sure that we're using the right containers, we're using the right preservatives, we have the right quality control procedures in place. If you're dealing with site investigations or you're, you're assessing um, uh, drinking water quality, you gotta, you gotta have good uh, quality assurance, quality control programs in place. And I mentioned, you know, we, we go out in the field and we sample wells, for example, and you look at the pumps that we use, traditionally these pumps have all sorts of Teflon um, O-rings and seals and things of that nature. Those things now have the potential to impart a PFAS load on our samples. So the equipment industry has come out with non-PFAS containing components and uh, have uh, been very busy testing these things to make sure that we, we are not in, 
putting a load on samples and creating false negatives, right? That could be really problematic uh, for a lot of organizations. Post-it notes, problematic. Sharpies are problematic. So we got to be real careful. I mentioned the clothing issue, Cortex and other products. Um, th this slide, um, you know, really talking about the part per trillion level. This is the Rose Bowl. We were talking a lot about the Rose Bowl and the college football season back when we made this slide a few months ago. But um, picture one drop of water in a, in a volume the size of, we used to talk parts per billion, a drop of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. Well, now we're talking about a drop of water in something the size of the Rose Bowl. Astronomically low levels and very, very difficult to accurately quantify down to single digit parts per trillion, as we saw earlier in the case of California's uh, notification concentrations. So a lot to think about when it comes to uh, laboratory activity. Treatment technologies, we're very busy on treatment technologies. I alluded to earlier that, you know, we're looking at destructive technologies, but, you know, right now, widely adopted solutions, things that you can go in and buy off the shelf are things like ion exchange resin, uh, <clears throat> activated carbon. These things work well at removing um, PFAS, but they're not very efficient. The breakthrough on those things is relatively quick and their capacity on a pound of PFAS per pound of carbon basis, for example, is not very good. And so we're looking for destructive technologies and largely are dealing with organizations, uh, teaming partners that are developing ideas and we're helping work in our laboratory to get these things moving up the technology cur curve. How do we pilot, bench test, pilot test, get them into the field to do demonstrations. This is a place we are very active with our technical innovation and leadership team. Um, this is an area that I am very, very involved with. <clears throat> I mentioned activated carbon. These are activated carbon tanks, um, the PFAS get absorbed and the GAC needs to be removed and sent off somewhere to either be regenerated or incinerated or, you know, landfilled or, or something. And so this process, while effective at, at treating the water and providing good quality drinking water from a sustainability standpoint, sending it to an incinerator is not a great idea. So we're looking at technologies that either improve this process or actually come up with a, a different process that leads to destructive treatment. Electrochemical oxidation is, is one such destructive treatment and, and we're dealing with the setup in our laboratory. There are commercial units available out there, but testing them with, with client specific waters, trying to figure out what types of compounds they can degrade. And in and, and the case of electrochemical oxidation, their effect, it's effective at you know, treating a wide range of chemicals and uh, biologicals. So it's just a matter of whether it'll work on a particular type of water. And we're set up to do those kinds of things in our lab. The key here is that these things tend to be relatively amenable to smaller flows. So remediation systems, scaling up to large scale, like drinking water flows, where flows can be on the order of thousands of gallons a minute. Uh, that is a challenge ahead. I think that's something that we're going to have to look at carefully, which is why looking at modifying processes like GAC and making them more efficient um, and producing less waste, so to speak, is, is something we're also focusing on. Uh, just a picture of our laboratory. Um, we're doing a whole lot of work with water and wastewater treatment, uh, tons of different instruments that help us understand you know, water, water, uh, drinking water quality, wastewater quality, and, and the things that we need to do to effectively treat it. So back to my, my, my as I wrap up here, back to my water cycle graphic, I just, I want to just hopefully leave you with, with some thoughts about the, the, the water cycle and, and how it moves, how water moves from point A to po point B, how PFAS can be transported with that and what kinds of things we need to be doing as a society to you know, curtail exposure um, and protect public health is, is really the, the primary focus. And so with that, I'll, I'll say that communication of these issues is really, really critical because when you make a statement to the public, their tendency in, 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 in the grand scheme of things is that they don't understand and so they tend to react negatively. 
And so people are generally afraid of chemicals. They don't understand chemistry. They don't understand toxicology and the, 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 the concept of half-life and, and the persistence of these things. Any chemicals is, is bad. So if you tell them that their, their water contains dihydrogen monoxide, they'll say, take it out. I say, you'll die of thirst, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, water um, under a different name is still water, but they don't know the difference in many cases between that and carbon monoxide. It's a chemical, I don't like it, protect me. And so I asked a couple of questions on, you know, just how do we react to, to statements like the following? And, and, and feel free to chime in, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that we're dealing with as a scientific community um, in fighting um, media um, inflammatory statements like PFAS chemicals cause cancer. What's your reaction to something like that? Is it, they might, you know, it depends on which one, but this is a class of 5,000 chemicals, most of which we don't have any studies on whether they have uh, an adverse health effect, uh, uh, no less cause cancer. Because of their widespread use in commerce, including household products and food packaging, PFAS can be detected in all of our blood. That's alarming. That's an alarming statement. I, I, you know, most people would be concerned about that. That leads to, you know, to letters to your congressman and saying, this is outrageous, this is unacceptable. Is it? Um, you know, it's debatable. I've been eating off of Teflon pans essentially my whole life. Um, maybe PFAS will kill me, but it'll probably be something else. And so we have to, we just have to think about these things rationally. There's no doubt that more study is needed, but are we going to be regulating in advance of those studies that help us make good decisions on, on how to regulate? There are over 5,000 PFAS chemicals and there are, there are known adverse health effects. Again, another statement that could be potentially inflammatory. We just don't know enough to say but 5,000 sounds like a big number. 5,000 sounds like it's everywhere. You know, and we, as we saw, it's widely present. But a lot of the studies that have been done on organisms are at high concentration. And we're, we're in that same dilemma of converting high concentration data to low concentration real exposure. And that's, that's really the, the, the trick of risk assessment. Last one, the likelihood of adverse health effects depends on several factors, such as the amount and concentration of PFAS ingested, as well as the time span of exposure. You make that statement to the public and their heads are going to explode, right? That's a tough one. I mean, that's all this, it just doesn't sound good. And so they'll probably just have a negative reaction. We as a scientific community have to find a way to more effectively communicate these issues. And that is a that is a heavy burden. I've been saying this for 30 years and it just that you know we get to PFAS over the last couple of years um, and it just seems to be gaining momentum um, uh, largely based on social media Hollywood pictures public opinion news media etc so I just want to leave those things and say that it's up to folks like us to be level-headed in all this promote this thing you know, follow the science right We've been hearing that a lot lately. We need to follow the science. And so with that, I think I just went a few minutes long, Samir, but I think we did pretty good. <laughs>